डिप्टी मैनेजर एक्चुअली आई एम टेकिंग ऑफ बिकॉज विद इन लिमिटेड टाइम आई विल हैव टू कवर अ वास्ट पोर्शन ऑफ कॉन्सेप्ट्स एंड थियोरेटिकल फ्रेमवर्क दैट आर रिलेटेड टू द मेंटालिटीज हिस्ट्री एट द आउटसाइड आई विश टू थैंक डॉक्टर मनोज कुमार फॉर द इनवाइट एंड आल्सो आई विश टू थैंक प्रोफेसर लुकमान हकीम for the coordination so my lecture title is nm and the ten table of mental disease history so i think contextually when we stand uh, at a point uh, in the history of human civilization in the 20th century in the midst of uh, a pandemic uh, traumatic experience the life world realities of the people at this given point of time is very important for the future history i wish to start from uh, the rubric of uh, uh, the springboard of uh, regression method a regression method that was posted in the past from the present then if we go from the past uh, from the present to the past you know the past will be more visible in that sense you know so when you look at uh, the present scenario you will be able to understand that you know a particular emotion is ruling the whole of the world standing at this time this perspective is very important for us as a historian because almost all the historians live in the present and uh, they write about the past but they live in the present so almost all the perspectives that emanate from the historian's uh, mental world or the kind of mental apparatus within which the historian is working Uh, we'll have a present tense in that sense a present tense um, with which i mean uh, that you are on lived realities or realizations about the present uh, is very important uh, in order to understand the past in its fullest uh, sentimental uh, what you call uh, nature for example today you know we are living in a pandemic stricken world people are uh, socially confined isolated they are keeping physical distance some people are quarantined um an emotion that is ruling as of now not only kerala not only the case of kerala but the whole of the world is uh, an emotion of fear and this particular emotion of fear and the mindset of the people that will be uh, you know expressing in various uh, forms uh, forms like stories novels even cinemas are coming uh, ram gopal varma cinema is upcoming uh, and then other literature forms paintings so all these are certain representations about the present pandemic so when the historian is um, writing the history of the present times after a span of 50 years or 100 years or 200 years naturally these life world realities of the people or the representative texts of the people and their moods uh, will be telling a different story of history not just the political history or the social history or the economic history or military history of history technology with which we are familiar that will be talking to you um a very different uh, uh, kind of history uh, what kind of history is that uh, that history deals with uh, emotions basically to start with uh, even though not an anal historian uh, i would like to uh, refer to um, a classic work that is published in the year 2006 written by joanna bulls a british historian who lives in london uh, which is entitled as the cultural history of fear and she has also uh, written a number of works um, you know uh, with uh, themes like pain death etc so in the cultural history of fear joanna books explicates um, the mental universe uh, of the british people during the second world war when the britons were you know actually they were caught up in the vortex of fear 
fear became, uh, in the words of Joanna Booth, fear became a national emotion in that sense of the whole British uh, uh, people, Britons. And uh, similarly, she also makes a crossing reference to uh, the fear psychosis, uh, pursuant to the uh, September 11, 2001 incident when the Americans were also, you know, they were also caught in the vortex of fear and fear becoming a national emotion. Sometimes that, that national emotion becoming a different kind of sensibility towards a section of the people, uh, you know, living in the world. So why I uh, referred to Joanna Bull's uh, work is that the profile of uh, the profile or the field of mentality's history um, is not just the autonomous terrain or academic terrain of the Anal School, but a galaxy of historians are working on it. But uh, for example, if you take Philip uh, Aries, you know, he is not uh, you know strictly an Anal historian, but one who uh, had a deep relation with the Anal historians and the school of um, anal historiography because it was a moment in that sense, you know. So uh, that is why I would like to remind you that uh, since because this is actually a lecture that is conceived and designed for uh, uh, postgraduate students, I would request you to stand in the present, experience the present and uh, understand the past in that sense. So when you understand the past like that, you know, the distance from the 14th century, for example, the plague times of 1341 uh, to 2020, uh, the distance is very short. The gap is very short. So you feel like living in a plague stricken um, uh, world of Europe uh, in the 14th century, for example, starting from 1341 onwards, even though you live in 2020, the distance is minimized in that sense, you know, because the same mental equipment, same mentality is there in the world these days that you can go get from um, different uh, relations, uh, problems in relations and connectivities uh, and mode of behavior that are supposed to be um, practiced in a pandemic stricken world, you know, in the uh, context of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. A virus has really reconfigured uh, uh, sensibilities of humans. A virus really uh, remapped the, the existing political maps of the world. A virus is asking you one pertinent question. Um, what are you and um, what is your mental disposition in the event of my coming? That is the coming of the virus. So here uh, I must uh, say that, you know, this mentality history uh, is a very pertinent uh, uh, historiographical uh, intervention uh, which was actually uh, mooted and reinforced by uh, the Anal historians right from uh, the founding of the journal Anal de Historie Economic et Sociale by Mark Bloch and uh, Lucien Feller. So both these historians were historians of mentalities also. And the particular uh, 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 treatment or the nature of their work was extended into uh, the frontiers of the anarchy stream in the subsequent uh, period uh, through as we generally classify it as the second, third and fourth generation of the anarchy stories. So basically, uh, now let me define it for you. What is actually mentality's history? Mentality's history actually studies uh, attitudes of common people uh, toward everyday life. Uh, our everyday life uh, is actually a very problematic uh, 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 thing because some of these spasmodic events or ephemeral events that are happening in our everyday day, uh, when you project that through a historical lens, you know, the meaning of that particular uh, activity or action uh, changes in that sense. It is not the meaning as you understand uh, a thing, for example, when we want to take a cup of tea, uh, a practice of uh, something like a beverage culture, which was introduced by, uh, introduced because of the plantation drive or plantation imperialism of the uh, British in India, drinking a tea um, on a day uh, in itself is a problematic thing. You know, you are drinking tea and not other beverages, but tea, why tea uh, is becoming, you know, what you call a favorite drink in that sense, you know. So uh, similarly, 
uh, it concentrates on um, ideas like childhood uh, what is childhood what is youth what is old age uh, what are belief patterns then what is sexuality uh, different ramifications of uh, sexual behavior um, depending on gender or depending not depending on gender in that sense you know it uh, also examines the uh, intricacies of relations within a family a role of family uh, it expands again into the terrain like birth death amusements games uh, emotions uh, uh, the whole emotions uh, so there is an emotive heuristics behind the methodology of mentality history uh, expanding it that you know the definition uh, apart from uh, the typologies uh, or the problems that are uh, addressed by a mentality historian it also investigates into a deeper plane uh, or into an advanced terrain because uh, by investigating into mental apparatuses uh, underpinning uh, human conceptions of intimate relations um, habits of mind and attitude towards elemental passages of life because it is basically on a broader, broader plane, uh, it sometimes takes the uh, historiographical expertise to the field of the uh, total history idea, the idea of total history. So if suppose someone is asking you who are the mentalities historians of the NL school, um, I have an option, I don't know whether you agree with me or not, based on my conviction, I will also say that Fernand Brother too is a historian of mentalities because actually he was uh, looking at the mental frames uh, of the people, you know, crisscrossing different areas in the Mediterranean. The mindset of a shepherd, how that is different from the mindset of uh, a plainsman agriculturist or a trader in the towns, uh, then um, a great or a wealthy merchant in the uh, port cities uh, to that of the activities of. Um, a sailor uh, because Brodel, even though Brodel uh, was not, um, uh, you know, inclined to use the term mentalities or uh, even though he was not, uh, um, you know, in favor of uh, this type of a school to a greater extent in that sense. Uh, and also, of course, also due to certain other differences of opinion uh, between some of the mentalities historians like Robert Mentru and all, uh, on a broader plane, uh, uh, Fernand Brothel's uh, idea of total history encapsulates uh, uh, different mindsets based on different ecologies uh, in different regions. So that is also a point I wish to um, add on to my lecture, not as a mentality historian, but as, as a historian of the long durée, especially when you read um, uh, the three volume uh, or, you know, on uh, capitalism and civilization, uh, you can understand uh, uh, especially from the volume on the structures of everyday life uh, when he tries to uh, problematize uh, uh, certain life world uh, incidences like uh, uh, the life in a club or uh, drinking a coffee and a tea uh, or following a particular mode of actor in that sense so that is why uh, i say that you know the mentality history finally aims at uh, broadening the concept of history, the terrain of history to that of uh, a total history or a history uh, globally in that sense, like some of the, some of the mentality historians use the term. But when you look at the origins of mentality history, um, there are certain obvious affinities uh, mentality history is having with uh, intellectual history in that sense, because intellectual history uh, developed before the institutionalization of Annal in the year 1929. Uh, intellectual history, thanks to the works of Huizinga and Bergdart, you know, these historians or uh, cultural studies experts were engaging with the history of ideas. There, the mentality was something like a world view, uh, which was encapsulated, which was enmeshed in the, uh, in the circles of high culture. So basically intellectual history concentrated on high culture. Uh, there was a stress on elite value forms and um, naturally uh, intellectual history was tied up with great ideas of society, um, closely tied to great intellectuals in that sense. So you can see that there is a marginalization of uh, uh, 
ലൈഫ് വേൾഡ് എക്സ്പീരിയൻസസ് ഓഫ് ദി കോമൺ പീപ്പിൾ ആൻഡ് ദ പൂർ പീപ്പിൾ ഇൻവെർട്ടിൽ ഹിസ്റ്ററി ക്യാൻ ബി കൺസിഡർഡ് എസ് എ ഹയർ ടൈപ്പ് ഓഫ് ഹിസ്റ്റോറിയോഗ്രാഫിക്കൽ എൻ്റർപ്രൈസസ് വിച്ച് വാസ് ബേസിക്കലി കൺസേൺഡ് വിത്ത് സെർട്ടൺ മോറൽ എത്തിക്കൽ കോഡ്സ് ആൻഡ് വാല്യൂ ജഡ്ജ്മെന്റ്സ് വിച്ച് വിർ പ്രൊഡ്യൂസ്ഡ് ഇൻ ദ മൈൻഡ്സ് ഓഫ് ഇന്റലക്ച്വൽസ് who basically belong to the elite sections of the society and um, at the same time intellectual history in that sense you know neglected the emotion of the medieval man uh, which was based on uh, the culture of basically a courtly society uh, a peasant society a society uh, which was you know sometimes uh, uh, finding and trapped uh, in uh, superstitions uh, or uh, the mysteries of nature things like that but from 1920s onwards the idealist tradition of cultural history waned and a new methodology emerged and the emergence of the new methodology can be considered as the first turn table you know what is a turn table uh, because in my title that uh, uh, phrase is used the turn table the turn table actually may you suppose someone of you may be having a turn table in your dinner hall but actually what i mean with the turn table uh is a turn table that is usually used to uh turn the engines of the train you know suppose a train is going in the northern direction uh it wants to move in the southern direction immediately that it will be uh, taken the turn table and then they immediately the north north uh, moving train will become a south moving train in that sense you know so there is a turn table in historiography a revolutionary change in historiography with the coming of the anna school and the formation of the nan school and the kind of standpoint epistemology of the school because these founder historians like lucien fever and mark bloch also pronounced as mark bloch you know they were uh, specialized in the training of interdisciplinary methodologies uh, perhaps you may be knowing the fact that both of them belonged to a school which predated the foundation of the anal school ecole normale superiore where uh, they were exposed to or they were integrating their theories and uh, um, uh, concepts uh, or debating their concepts and theories with a larger circle of social scientists belonging to various um, uh, you know disciplines like anthropology demography law economics political science etc etc and they found it very interesting to understand one thing as hermans mukhia and maurice einbad are using uh, the french studies uh, in history in the first volume that is inheritance they argue that you know actually it was this kind of a uh, what you call intellectual cooperation and integration uh, which uh, actually enabled the anal historians to go more to a higher cognitive level of interdisciplinary uh, thought processing in that sense so in the cultural ambience uh, you know uh, mark bloch and um, lucien fever uh they took a very different uh, epistemological positioning or standpoint epistemology and lucien fever uh the hot tempered historian among uh, between among these two you know he once declared that you know there is a distinction between uh, our history and other histories our history and their kind of history uh actually he was building something like you know a cleavage in order to say that you know anal history is entirely different from other kinds of histories uh, which were concentrating on a different methods or uh, which were concentrating on different epistemologies in that sense so in that sense um, uh, anal historiography can, can be considered as uh, a second french revolution in that sense it was really an, a revolutionary movement inside the historiography uh, of france and later it uh, permeating into other areas in that sense so that explains the reason why in the first volume of anal a journal that is anal the history economic and social um these historians marsh mark bloch and lucien fever together wrote in the preface that it is our intent to raise the banner of protest against uh, deep schisms that exist in different social sciences deep schisms they were pointed to deep schisms that exist in social sciences and it is our duty to raise the banner of protest so it can be considered in that sense as a protest uh, historiography also in that sense you know who mooted the idea of interdisciplinarity and this interdisciplinarity of a higher kind as i said if i quote the um, words of uh, ronan barth an interdisciplinarity brings in a discipline or a subject uh, whose outcome theoretical outcome 
differs from any kind of disciplines because you know perhaps it may it may draw its attention it may draw its uh, theories and concepts from uh, some other disciplines like anthropology or history or political science or sociology but ultimately when they address a problem in history it stand apart it actually you can't say that it belongs to the historical methodology so that sort of a cognitive integrated kind of interdisciplinarity led to uh, you know a take off stage in the revolutionary historiography in the 1920s uh, mentality's history in that sense became a methodology of the annals code not simply a method but a methodology uh, i argue that it became a theoretical what i call uh, one of the theoretical terrain for the annals school and there was a shift from the veiled views as i said earlier to uh, when i refer to the works of huizinga and barbdar uh, who concentrate on, on the ideas uh, or intellectual history there was a shift from the veiled views uh, to the structures uh, through which conceptions are conveyed basically that they are they were starting to they were uh, initiating a historiography to address the culture of the common man so the focus on forms of regulated mental activities became an important agenda of this school uh, what are these forms uh, forms uh, include a different kind of aesthetic images linguistic codes gestures ritual social customs belief systems etc etc there is a wide arena of you know forms what is the form of a particular mental expression in that sense and through the study of these forms um, um, the historian tries to map a universe not a political universe not an ideological universe but a mental universe in that sense so it's not a history of ideas uh, but a history of uh, uh, mind changing relations between man's uh, rational and emotional faculties there is a there is a difference between man's rational and emotional faculties and in that sense the shift really took the terrain of historiography to popular culture so uh, this shift from the ideas of intellectuals and its to the structures of the mind of every human so it was actually you know attainable in that sense you know the traditional um, the traditional distinction between high and popular culture naturally uh, got disappeared it diminished in that sense its importance now we come to the first historian lucien fever who wrote um, i think you are aware of that a wonderful work uh, actually the uh, the springboard of that work was a, a single a word or a phrase a thesis standing on a thesis he made a jump and reached uh, a very higher level of interpretative uh, uh, historiographical engagement in one of the most celebrated works of mentality's history that is the problem of unbelief in the 16th century um colon the religion of rabelais rabelais the problem of unbelief in the 16th century the religion of rabelais rabelais was a french monk um who lived in the 16th century um and he was considered by earlier historians you know, people like abel de frank etc you know trying to project him project him as uh, an atheist because of some of his uh, humorous and um, um uh, antipathetic statements and jokes towards the church including the clergy the bishops and even the pope so uh, based on that you know um, some of the historians and um, philosophers uh, tried to project uh, rabelais uh, who was a french monk uh, and a physician in one uh, as an atheist so here using structural linguistic methodologies um especially as the uh, semiotical semiotics the science of science as postulated by fern and sushur uh, a structural linguistic uh, uh, methodology actually that was not there at the time of a uh, writing of lucien fever but actually he was following a understanding of the linguistic forms and expression because your um, uh, mindset your life world uh, realization is expressed through a particular language and he searched for the word atheism there and this idea uh, because an idea is not an abstract entity uh, born fully matured an idea is not uh, born as fully matured in that sense but it takes shape and develop in a context so that context was investigated by losing fever 
And he came to an analysis, he came to a conclusion or basic argument that the mental equipment of the 16th century uh, man, including the environment, including institutional structures, uh, including the psychological attitudes and linguistic uh, usages or linguistic profile, unbelief uh, was beyond the ken of the 16th century man. So it was not supposed to, to be a, a mental you know, state uh, which was to be explicated through a word uh, atheism. So he argued that orientation in thinking um, uh, is there, there is an orientation in thinking through a selective use of words because one perceives uh, knowledge, one perceives a uh, uh, particular relation in that culture through certain words in that sense, you know. So uh, finally he came to a conclusion uh, arguing that 16th century man could not altogether abandon the religious scheme of thought which was his surest form of reference because it was largely a period that was you know dominated by christian church and uh, the mindset and collective consciousness of the people belonging to different uh, uh, classes you know in that sense was actually pinned to pinned to a religious scheme of thought and that is why he said that that's, that religious scheme of thought was his surest form of reference so the mind of the 16th century uh, lack the vocabulary of sophisticated analytical terms like abstract or reality in that sense. So there were no words in that sense to understand the precise mental attitude of the people belonging to that period. So that's why he said the thoughts of individuals, the thoughts of individuals were shackled, shackled means chained by general mental attributes such as illogicality and imprecision in the place of in a concrete reality and abstraction it was illogicality and imprecision and so in the lexicography of that period this word was not bound to express an attitude of enmity towards uh, the church he again went to explain uh, the in the book he explains the real character and nature of uh, uh, Rabelais who was a French monk as I said uh, and he came to understand that Rabelais was a firm believer in Jesus Christ because his religion was a belief in the interior religion and he was actually rejected by the kind of a materialistic orientation of the church towards uh, uh, people, towards systems. So this materialistic orientation of uh, uh, the church was actually uh, the problem that Rabelais was trying to confront through some of humorous and uh, humorous remarks, sarcastic remarks, which irritated uh, uh, the, the Christian church. So the interiority of the mental framework of Rabelais was actually misinterpreted by uh, earlier historians who used to consider him as an atheist. But this um, clarification or uh, uh, assumption, analysis of uh, uh, losing uh, fever comes from uh, the point of view that is a basic argument uh, that 16th century men could not altogether abandon the religious scheme of thought and the mind of 16th century man uh, you you cannot find a, a vocabulary which include these sophisticated analytical terms like atheism uh, for uh, he also compared with other terms which were absent in that time like abstraction uh, concrete uh, 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 words like that. So, depending on that, uh, he tried to construct a uh, mental consciousness uh, within which Rabelais worked and within which a section of the people in uh, Europe were, uh, you know, actually having this kind of a, what you call, um, um, animos, uh, uh, you know, animosity towards the church. And then comes uh, the work of um, uh, Mark Bloch. Uh, which uh, the first work of Mark Bloch, uh, which was uh, uh, written in 1923 prior to the formation of Anna School, because Anna School was founded in 1929, <coughs> which is uh, in French in in language, it is Le Roy Thaumaturges, that is the royal touch, uh, or otherwise, it is the touch for scrofula. Uh, he was probing into the sacred mystics surrounding kingship in Europe during Middle Ages. Uh, actually, uh, you know, 
he was pointing to a particular uh, you know a touch a phenomenon of touch where uh, people infected with a kind of disease which is called scrofula uh, in some of the texts it is wrongly uh, interpreted as a skin disease but actually it was not a skin disease uh, it was actually caused by tuberculosis bacillus adenitis and uh, that leads to uh, an inflammation of uh, ganglia a cluster of nerves in the throat uh, leading to uh, inflammation uh, uh, a wound like structure will um, emerge in the on, on the throat region uh, which will expand in uh, expand to other uh, parts of the face uh, and a reddened face you know uh, with this type of an appearance uh, uh, something like a ghostly and demon devilish appearance you know naturally people were not liking to see such people so they were isolated uh, they were regarded as you know sinners in that sense you know so there was only one therapeutic intervention um, it was not medical it was not medicine it was not any other rational kind of thing but a belief among the people that if you go to the king and the, if the king touches and put a cross mark on the forehead of the individual then that will be a cure so this was the belief and mark bush was looking at this act uh, he was looking at this single touch uh, in order to explain uh, the mental consciousness of the people right from uh, 11th century to 18th century because this touch uh, this touch the royal touch the phenomena lasted from 11th century to 18th century you must understand that uh, from 11th century to 18th century means even with the progression of scientific rationality even with advancement in science and technology uh, this touch was a normal thing for the people to believe even the skeptics you know who questioned these kind of interventions you know, simply believed the um, accounts of witnesses you know so in that sense miracle became a fossilized relic miracle became an important structural composition component of uh, uh, the royalty the royalty worked on miracles and such cures such superstitions so that in that sense that is connected to um, the question of power because the validation and continuation of the power of the absolute monarch that is from the 11th century to 18th century even louis 16 the last monarch of the bourbon dynasty he even touched for scofflaw an emperor who uh, remarked that, you know at the time of assuming the uh, uh, kingship you know the throne as if the universe is falling on me even he was capable of touching why it is because the naive readiness in the minds of people the people were just imagining that you know it is like that you know they simply believed it like that because of the power of the miracles so this continued to validate this continued to fortify the bastions of power of the king in some sense so the power of collective illusion um, uh, it was you know predominating into different phases in that sense right from 11th and 12th century, 11th century to the 18th century it continued up to 18th century even in the age of modern science and scientific rationality um, uh, it had no bar on this kind of a sacred illusion and uh, the absolute monarch enjoyed this uh, because of the validation and uh, what he called uh, because it acted as a crucial factor in the continuation of his uh, power and the second work uh, or a magnum opus of uh, uh, mark bloch uh, which is actually feudal society also addressed this problem uh, mentalities uh, and he develops uh, the study of mentality fully uh, as the history of feudal ideologies uh, he just wanted to look at feudalism not just as an economic organization but as a mental apparatus uh, which he explains very well in volume one book two uh, in a chapter entitled the conditions of life and mental climate so here he was trying to explicate mental equilibrium of individuals mental frameworks a sense of what is measurable the mental scaffolding uh, in the feudal period uh, language the usages of phrases and even as, uh, subscribing to certain anthropological perspectives you know uh, including you know why people were violent in that sense you know and he also implicated the uh, ties that is the dependency ties uh, uh, which were actually created during the feudal period uh, which explained a kind of cultural affiliation uh, of the lower classes with the higher classes 
And he also wrote, uh, apart from this, uh, Bloch also wrote on the history of attitude towards food, uh, especially on the history of French diet in uh, uh, Encyclo Francaise, in, Fra in French Encyclopedia. So, uh, uh, so these two historians, uh, the legacy of Bloch and um, Fever uh, was actually the inventory of a mental equipment. Uh, this mental equipment can, can be considered as a structure of uh, building blocks uh, from which ideas are formed. Uh, it is not what people thought in that sense. Don't think that it is actually what people thought, but uh, how it was possible for them to think like that. What factors contributed to a kind of thinking uh, in those times? And so that, was the, uh, a, that was the research problem addressed by these two historians, especially the mental horizons of age. Uh, the culture of an age is to be grasped in the habits of mind common to all. So only then we'll be able to understand the mental consciousness, uh, the mental apparatus within which people were thinking in those times. So it is the history of human sentiment not ideas. The French term mentality is actually, uh, it strongly corresponds to sentiment, sentimental affiliations, not only ideas. So understanding emotional changes is a prerequisite for understanding rational changes uh, was the conclusion actually uh, drawn by both these historians. Uh, and they were looking at, you know, a historical curve which was predominantly central in the medieval times. For example, if you take a historical curve, in the center, you get the emotion. The curve, you have the emotion in the center, the top position. But why does the intellectual ideas in the modern society, you know, if you take the curve again, you look at the ideas, the intellectual ideas. So this differentiation, this distinction, marked two kinds of mental apparatuses for the medieval society and for the modern society. So Bloch actually, uh, he was concentrating on mental phenomena in common parlances connected to social and everyday material life. But Fever broadened uh, it to all levels of a mental universe and integrated it into a single totality, intellectual and psychological phenomena. Brodel was actually, sorry, Fever was actually following a higher kind of um, mentalities history in his times. But uh, it is very interesting to note that most of the historians, uh, mentalities historians followed on the footsteps of uh, Mark Bloch and not uh, Lucien Fever. And one such historian who comes um, in the second generation of the annal, uh, uh, who need not be that much familiar uh, to you, I think, I suppose, uh, is Robert Mantrou, M-A-N-D-R-O-U, so Robert Mantro, he wrote a book. Um, that book is entitled Introduction to Modern France, 1500 to 1640. That is what is the mental mindset of the modern France. That is from the 16th century to the 17th century, the mid 17th century, with a subtitle, an essay in historical psychology. An essay in historical psychology, which was published in the year 1961 here, uh, expanding the terrain of mentality's history, you know, uh, Mantro comes to a very important uh, finding, um, which can be considered as a real thought-provoking uh, findings of a mentality's historian, where he, where he argues uh, that the early modern peasant uh, was a prisoner of natural environment, uh, which was unintelligible to him. To him, the imperceptible nature actually chained the man chained the man. He was actually chained by the conduits of environment or nature. So ignorance of climatic changes, uh, ignorance about changes in production of crops, uh, its relation with uh, human health, environment relation with human health, and technological inadequacies. Uh, the human was the victim of unrelenting physical misfortune. The human. Uh, he is pointing to the, uh, the low classes in the society or the poor classes in the society. And this was acute, even not from a general sense, it was acute in the case of the poorest with the least uh, you know, resource base at their disposal. So what happened? He comes to a very in interesting conclusion. 
that the accumulated fears in the mind of these people because of this uh, lack of understanding about nature, natural elements and uh, changes happening in climate, etc., etc., uh, it became a permanent anguish in the minds of the people and that later on became a source of psychological disorders and uh, character instability. So environment, environmental conditioning of the human mind uh, became a focus of the mentality historian during the time of uh, uh, Robert Mantrou, uh, where he proceeds to argue that collective psychological instability of the peasants, um, because of these environmental difficulties, because of the ignorance, uh, led to uh, something like an anxiety psychosis, anxiety psychosis, um, and coupled with the issue of here means he makes you know a very interesting connotation, a connection between this kind of an ignorance or um, incompetency in explaining natural phenomena with that of the fall in production uh, due to various climatic reasons and also because of uh, continuing intermittent wars during this period. Uh, uh, this, this, led, this led to uh, a mindset of uh, mentality of the hunted. And he add, adds to this particular problem of psychology he also adds a problem which is the malnutrition. People were starving. There was no food to eat. There were famines. So this mindset, that is the particular environmental difficulties coupled with this malnutrition problem created a collective consciousness of mentality of the hunted. So mentality of the hunted with its superstitions, it started an outburst of anchor and its hypersensitivity because people reacted to even to small things with you know um, great uh, angry anchor or uh, disappointment in that sense you know what usually happens with uh, a hundred animal uh, you can see in the national geographic other channels uh, how a deer is hunted by the lion it will it will try its maximum to escape from the uh, from the predator and finally it is subjected to the will and uh, fancy of the predator his enemy in that sense. So that kind of a mental emotion was there. And because of that particular mental emotion, uh, people were believing in miracles uh, and magics and these kind of traditional superstitious uh, belief systems, which Robert Mandrew argues uh, that this kind of a belief in miracles and superstitions uh, was something like uh, an emotional emancipation. Because magic served uh, as a mental system that saved the peasants from total despair. That is only relief. Uh, that will definitely lead them to a soothening, uh, something like an amelioration of their uh, mental agony. Something also, in some sense, it can also be considered as an entertainment for uh, the mind, which is uh, which was which was clustered within this hundred mindset. You know, so peasant was tied here very heavily to the burden of traditions. So they were following these particular customs and traditions. They were believing in these kind of superstitions within courts. I don't want to use the superstitions of medieval period because, you know, we are when we look at them, uh, we are trying to impose our rationality on them. Uh, maybe that kind of a rationality or rationalization is not a, um, not a good thing when we interpret uh, people living in a different uh, uh, spatial and uh, temporal dimension like the medieval people. So it is their beliefs and habits that became burden for, for them in that sense. And Mandro finally argues that it was it's still impossible for an impenetrable nature to be interpreted in France at that time. It is not possible to interpret nature. It was beyond the comprehension of the individual, the human. So that knowledge of the outside world was approximate, imprecise, and irrational. That is why the foothold of, that is why the domination of the ritual performances in men's lives. So that such a, such a brilliant connotation is made by uh, Robert Mantro. Now we come to another historian, as I told you, who comes within the outside anal circle, but a close associate with the anal school, uh, Philip Aries. Philip Aries uh, wrote a book, um, uh, which is entitled The Century of Childhood, Century of Childhood. And he asked a pertinent question maybe seemingly very problematic question for us. Was there childhood in medieval ages? Seems to be a very curious and a problematic question for us now, because we imagine that childhood existed all over the time, 
because children were there no adult was possible without a child in that sense so what a, what an important question that you know philip eris is asking we may think like that but when he interrogated western attitudes towards childhood family and emotional bondings uh, he came to an argument that um, uh, children were treated as adults in the medieval period so uh, there was no status quo for the children uh, and um, because the argument goes like this that each life stage was born historically and that there was no childhood in the medieval times there was no childhood in the medieval times because children were treated as adults it was it doesn't mean that medieval men had no conception of childhood rather he had no idea about the development of childhood you know he was it was not possible for him to relate a child uh, and uh, the role of the child the status of child in the life world of uh, uh, the persons in the family so he argues that a recognition of childhood as a special time of life separate from adulthood uh emerged in the modern times especially in the 18th century uh, because you know it is a historical process of evolution in that sense if you want to say that uh, childhood existed there as a concept as an idea so this developed from the end of the medieval ages uh, to enter the consciousness of the strata of western society only in the 18th century so there is a continuum but that become an abstract you know a concept only with the 18th century when um, you know the modern age started reckoning age started uh, using registers uh, started looking at differentiating people based on their age um, when they started differentiating them from on the age factor even in uh, the classification of the classes and the school education system etc etc so this developed uh, um from the end of the medieval ages to enter the consciousness of all strata of western society so family came to serve the purpose of this new emerged children in that sense you know so uh, there was a coincidence that childhood also emerged together with the uh, reinforcement of the concept of uh, family so child's personality became distinct and uh, it was a parent's responsibility to see that the child the children are you know mentored or uh, uh, they are a safeguard or protector in that sense you know the family in that sense became a refuge uh, at uh, in the world at a later stage so he says eris says that childhood uh, came only in the 18th century later half of the 17th century 18th century and youth emerged in 18th century adolescence in the 19th century and old age only in the 20th century that is the present century the last century so here he comes with certain major theoretical concerns uh, because family he argues that it was related to a new concept which evolved in the 17th century um concomitant with uh, here he ties up this particular argument with the mortality rates of children when there was a decrease in the mortality rate of children in the 17th century later half of the 17th century changes in education system as i said so a feeling about the childhood as well as a concept of it a feeling about the childhood as well as a concept of it uh, you know emerged only with the time of the 18th century because uh, ch- childhood was not recognized as a distinct phase of human human existence in the medieval times uh, times and there was much less separation of adults and children one factor which he poses here is the age factor because in the in medieval ages the age was not known people just did, did not care about the exact ages that's a very serious thing that we need to understand uh, and this particular passion for uh, curious passion for recording ages emerged only with uh, you know the recent development uh, that is uh, the 18th century development corresponding to the exact account keeping uh, you know by church and uh, state catholic church and uh, state in different regions and even when he po- when he looks at you know some of the paintings and images uh, depicted the medieval artists depicted children as adults reduced to a smaller scale without any difference in the expression and features so the representation of the artist the representation of the child in the mind of the artist uh, which is actually a reflexive kind of understanding image building also proved just opposite to our concept of childhood because children were considered as adults only as eris argues there was just a scaling down of the stature of the children in that sense a physical scaling down 
uh, which he tried to understand through a series examination of the 17th century portraits of children uh, in the domestic context, uh, indicating interest in childhood. Now the question of mortality in medieval times, uh, children were treated as neutral beings, you know, that's the actual term that is used by Philippe Aries, uh, when their life was something, you know, uh, an accident in between life and that many children were dying, mortality rate was very high, but the decrease in the infant mortality rate led to corresponding increase in the attention to children because they were to be safeguarded, they were to be protected. Uh, and you can see a corresponding increase in the portraits of children also in different occasions, even uh, especially uh, the morning of a child's death, uh, the portraits containing uh, this kind of, you know, funerals or, uh, uh, or dead bodies of the children that became a serious matter to be mourned. So the existence and uh, um, realization that children are a major part of the family uh, came at a later stage. Uh, uh, something like a culture of childhood emerged in that sense, you know. So children became visible also through their visible expressions, uh, like Philip, uh, Philip uh, Aries suggests, through their renderings, etc. So expressions which he um, refers to the use of the French terms like uh, tutu and uh, dada, you know, calling their dads and all, you know, uh, the styles of clothing uh, which underwent revolutionary changes uh, a specific games related to children emerged. Toys uh, for the amusement of the children were created and made and circulated within children. And one can see in 17th century, he focuses on certain dress, dresses of the children like the frogs, the emergence of the frogs, the ribbon, the ribbon tailored frogs, uh, and the toys are considered to be certain artifacts uh, which can be considered as an interest in the life of the child, the child as a soft um, body, as a soft entity uh, whose interest uh, to be safeguarded and protected by the parent, became a parental responsibility. And he also comments that the fairy tales which were, uh, um, which were used for amusements uh, by even the adult in the medieval period became a prerogative of the uh, children because stories telling sessions like that the parent telling a story to the child emerged uh, with the passage of time uh, in the 18th century. And uh, he also points to the child body factor where a child was just a thing of amusement uh, uh, in the medieval times, but uh, through his uh, uh, disciplining the body and taming the body or uh, uh, protecting the body, the child's body attained a status quo uplifted during the time of uh, uh, the modern times, especially because of the coming of disciplining and schooling. And schooling in medieval times, which was open, as I told you, uh, uh, open to all people, irrespective of the age factor, uh, became uh, uh, classes depending on the ages, age factor. And educators became specialized in the teaching based on ages. The classification of teaching even depended on the age factor. Uh, teachers for teaching in the lower standards and the higher standards, you know. Such a classification also emerges later when the identity of the child is created in the mind of the modern human. And so if demarcated childhood as a specific stage of uh, life, and finally you can see the emergence of the family uh, in the 18th century, uh, families became nuclear uh, with specific identity and privacy uh, that also is explicated through a help of understanding some of the portraits and paintings of the families uh, which rose in number during the 18th century uh, because the basic idea of family also changed. Uh, that is the argument of Aries. Aries uh, that is the family which is something like a big social gathering. Uh, in his own words, concentric circles of relation, concentric circles of relations comprising of the lords, uh, their relatives, uh, uh, their friends, uh, portages, clients, and deputies all lived and engaged in particular manner-like situation. So that particular thing, uh, that's also a similar thing was also there in the case of uh, people in the uh, lower classes. Uh, there, there was a grand mingling in that sense, but that disappeared and family began to draw into itself uh, a transition stage in the character and nature of the family and Iris argues that this inward movement of the family uh, led to a corresponding interest in uh, interest or attention towards the children, the inward movement of the family. Because new value systems emerged, 
proper etiquettes for children were uh, uh, formulated and proper upbringing of children became families of responsibility and through these uh, changes it is argues that the child became the center of the family so the family or family's attention so that is why it is argues that you know the century of the childhood is 18th century and before that one uh, is not in a position to understand uh, exactly what is childhood based on the sensibilities you know so um, there is there are serious criticism against uh, this work saying that childhood is experienced differently in different periods uh, but the book enables us to understand the shift in notions to childhood and when at what point of time it led to a consciousness a popular consciousness uh, um, uh, when the child became uh, uh, a center in the thought world of the humans that is the basic you know argument of uh, 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 philip eris in centuries of childhood now there are also other works like cheese and worms uh, uh, written by carlo gisberg uh, which really look at the peasant culture of the 18th century uh, as is revealed through uh, the uh, the ideologies or uh, reflective mind system on thought process of uh, of a miller called menocchio um, uh, which is set in actually a very micro historical uh, historical method of mentality uh, because micro history of carlo ginsberg you know it looked at the smallest possible scale for widening the mindset of an individual a menocchio a person you know whose mindset was widened in order to understand uh, uh certain notions which were not within the grasp of earlier historians uh, and menocchio stands between high culture and low culture uh, something like a hybrid culture that stated thing uh, that uh, you know looked at things differently menocchio was a miller and he was a well read person he read bible he read uh, boccaccio's uh, decameron uh, travels of uh, mendeleev and uh, also uh, other books which came across his uh, hands and he let to believe that you know some of the arguments you know contained in the book um, were tried to locate within oral traditions that is why he stands in the uh, in the mid in the center of high culture and uh, oral culture uh, trying to appropriate the high culture ideologies textual ide ideologies through understanding it within the complete oral uh, tradition and his mill also became you know something like a meeting point for many people to come where uh, the miller you know he exchanged his uh, ideas with these people and later on he was uh, uh, tried uh, tried for a heresy and finally uh, uh, killed executed but he was a materialist for him the idea was that the entire culture of the world was material he argued finally he argued that even god emerged from the material culture therefore uh, manokia became a heretic when he said that god too emerged from this material culture because everybody is emerging from material culture god is also emerging from material culture this type of you know um, an explanation given to um, religion and religious understanding you know branded manokio as a heretic you know but the mentality of the rural village and the oral culture is the essence of uh, um, ginsberg's uh, work because menocchio always used uh, uh, something like an interpretative uh, interpretive filter um, informed by oral tradition uh, to read the written word so all of all the books he read were you know analyzed through the mental framework of uh, this uh, interpretative uh, filter of menocchio that is why uh, it led to a different belief in that sense you know that is with the standpoint of you know uh, menocchio uh, changed uh, from that to the prevailing standpoint and the book traces mentality of the times uh, through a microscopic analysis uh, of the uh, uh, position taking or ideologies or versions and uh, words uttered by the miller uh, and in an interview carlo ginsberg explains in what way he tried to get these documents from the archives in rome which was opened to the historian based on a request that he made to uh pope john paul ii and now uh, th th there is another work uh, which is actually centered around around the uh, miracles and the mystic beliefs concerning uh, a dog that is uh, the holy grey hound uh, the holy grey hound guide for healer of children since the 13th century published in the year 8, 1983 by 
um, the fourth generation and historian, uh, Sean Cloud Schmidt. Uh, you can see, sped it from my uh, PPT, uh, which investigates into the theological narratives of a belief in a dog becoming a saint among villagers in France, uh, where uh, Schmidt uh, transports from travel, travels from oral tradition uh, to uh, symbolic gestures, structural analysis, and peasant societies, uh, and the mental consciousness through study of folklore, uh, based on uh, the writings uh, of uh, uh, a French uh, <coughs> Dominican friar. Uh, he came to understand a particular practice uh, which emerged from a uh, folklore. Um, the story goes like this, that, you know, it is something like the Panjandra story. You might have heard, you know, a dog who was safeguarding the child from the attack of a, a dragon um, uh, was uh, mercilessly killed by uh, the Lord, the knight, uh, when he came to see that, you know, uh, his baby was in the cradle and the dog was watching the baby. And uh, a demon came, sorry, a dragon came, in some stories it is called a snake, and tried to attack the, ba uh, the baby in the credit. So the dog uh, defended and ultimately killed the, dra uh, the uh, dragon. Uh, uh, and finally, when the uh, knight came, that is the father of the child came, he saw the dog with all the blood stains and also blood you know, spilled over in the room. He imagined that this was the god who killed his child. So he immediately shot the uh, dog, killed the dog. But when he came to see that, you know, the infant is safe in the credit without any injury, he came to understand the faithfulness of the dog. And finally, though, that dog was put into a well and stones were uh, thrown, up, thrown into the well. Uh, kept, uh, you know, he also planted certain trees in order to demarcate this site uh, uh, because his faithful dog is there. And this particular uh, geographical um, corridor that is the story you know it uh, goes from north Italy to Picardy in France uh, the story of the death of the dog a greyhound uh, that associated with uh, some of the life world realities of the peasants in that sense you know yeah he started uh, questioning the superstitions and inquisition inquisitorial records uh, and he and uh, he also posits the argument the dog became a saint with a miraculous healing power because it was a good dog in the coming years many people started coming to this particular site and they started worshipping or praying to the God uh, for relieving the sickness and uh, diseases of the children. So the dog assumed the, uh, the name Saint uh, Gwynford and uh, this was revealed to the friar and the monk through certain confessions uh, you know, uh, took place. Some of the women uh, confessed to the uh, friar, the monk, uh, that you know, they had committed this type of a mistake. And then this particular site was banned and the people who went to that site were considered as heretics. But at the same time, here also, Schmidt argues that it continued, the belief in the dog curing the childhood diseases continued from the 13th century to 19th century, late 19th century. Here Schmidt goes to examine some of the archeological records where uh, the archaeologists excavated uh, the cult of this particular site. The uh, cult of this practice, you know, was excavated um, and they came to understand that, you know, even in the late 19th century, uh, some of these prayers and uh, cult practices, you know, were there in the site where the dog was, you know, buried. So uh, these are some of the points, you know, to note regarding mentalities history, uh, where uh, the historians were trying to look at the mental consciousness of the people at a given point of time, and uh, they walked differently, and they asked different questions. Uh, they asked different questions to uh, the context, uh, whereby they were able to uh, understand the mental horizon of people, uh, particular mental apparatuses within which uh, the people thought and behaved in the past. I was just narrating these, you know, um, uh, these um, books in order to give you an understanding about different kind of arguments, uh, you know, uh, proposed and posited by these mentality historians. If you look at the blog, 
you know, the body became uh, an important uh, site of investigation, the body. Uh, the, the touch for scrofula also, you know, points to the pathology of touch in some sense, you know, the healing practice. So that particular body became, you know, an important uh, site for a historical inquiry. Um, and because he also used uh, uh, methodologies from historical anthropology uh, in order to understand these superstitious beliefs or miracles which became, as I said, fossilized the relic in the mental thought process of the people. And further, the whole argument you can see that emerged from one single word, atheism. So there he was trying to understand the relative meaning differences. What were the changes in meanings, you know, as we see today, the people in those times saw the world through a particular, uh, you know, what a kind of meaning that is attributed uh, uh, to the mindset of that particular period, the collective consciousness of the period. Then Mantro tried to connect mental consciousness with the uh, environmental uh, uh, context and ambience, uh, uh, environmental context of the peasants living in the 16th century, where he uh, tried to project the idea of mentality of the hunted. And uh, Philip Aries, he tried to understand the notions of uh, childhood uh, emerging through records, paintings, uh, registers, uh, and how the childhood became a concept and ideology in the 18th century. And Ginsberg explicated well the peasant thought world through examining the thought processes of a single miller through a methodology of microhistory. And the last historian, as I said, Sean uh, 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 Claude Schmidt uh, was looking at the site where a dog was buried and how that site became uh, a reference point for uh, people. Uh, and many of the people thronged to that site under the belief that, you know, uh, prayer to that dog, uh, naturally, uh, Saint Guinfort uh, uh, will definitely heal uh, their sick children. So, right from um, uh, uh, royal touch, right from Lucian Fever's, uh, sorry, Mark Bruce's royal touch to the Holy Greyhound, Guinfort Healer of Children since the 30th century, written by Sean Claude Schmidt. You know, this galaxy of historians were engaging with the problem of the mentalities or mental consciousness, um, understanding uh, belief systems, stories, images, excavating through the changes in the relational dimensions of the people through this phase. I think I will stop here. Now it is 8, 10, I think. Thank you very much.